model for this would actually be uh, a proposal I can send to you or, or leave with the club uh, my slides, and you can click on the link. A proposal by one of uh, Mitt Romney's economic advisors, Glenn Hubbard, he's the dean of the Columbia Business School, has argued for exactly this in a paper called Streamlined, Refinanc Streamlined Refinancings, um, arguing exactly for this policy. What's interesting is that um, reporters have asked the Romney campaign about this, and they said, we don't agree with it. But yet, Glenn Hubbard's their chief economic advisor, so that's why I don't get involved in that stuff. It's just you know, it's a losing proposition. Policy prescription two. Um, right now, treasury returns are incredibly low. And in particular, if you take account of inflation, the United States government can, for all practical purposes, borrow money for free. Households and businesses want to hold this stuff. They want cash, they want treasuries. So, let's give it to them. This is where you're supposed to throw stuff in. We should borrow more. I know that sounds nuts, but we actually ought to be borrowing more, but in a very strategic, very specific way. We shouldn't take these bonds, we should borrow, and we should invest in projects that we know pay rates that are higher than two or three percent. Things like infrastructure, wastewater treatment would be one of my favorites. See, I'm really a fun guy at a party. Um, <laughs> transportation infrastructure, pre-K education, all of these things have proven rates of return that are well, in, uh, well, exceed, uh, well exceeding three and a half percent or so. But most importantly, I would do it like Ben Bernanke did yesterday with the quantitative easing. I would do it publicly and do it loudly so that everybody knows that this is the policy of the federal government. So I've talked too long. Thanks for your attention. I'd love to answer your questions if possible. So, Tammy, you tell me how this works. <laughs> Uh, give uh, President Obama a scorecard on the economy and give us a prediction of President Romney uh, if he's elected. If I knew what I tell him, that's what I tell him. What I'm asking for in a veiled way is uh, a who do you support? Who do I support? Well, I, that I'm not going to be quite so blunt about because I don't think that's why you had me come today. But. Um, <laughs> I would give President Obama a B, maybe a C plus, on his economic policies, partly because of what I said in the previous slide, I'll go back to that, publicly and loudly was lacking, I think, throughout this administration, about here is where we're going to go. That was something that needed to be done. Um, in terms of a President Romney, I'm really concerned that he has no economic model in mind of how the economy works other than tax cuts. Um, you have to have at least some sense of how the world works, and I'm not sure he's got one. I'm not sure President Obama necessarily does either, but I'm even more sure that Governor Romney doesn't. And so that's where I am on that. I'm not a political pundit, so I'm not going <laughs> to. There's a, a lot of cash on corporate balance sheets today. There's a lot of cash on corporate balance sheets today, which is probably part of what's been driving the market and mm -hmm. to, the, to the returns that it's had over the last year. How do you see that interfacing with um, Europe and just the global economy as a whole in terms of that potential GDP number and people being hopeful about a recovery based upon reinvestment? Yeah, this issue, to make sure everybody heard the question, certainly me are really um, concerned about because it's a signal that businesses are not necessarily confident about the future and they're just kind of holding their cards really close to the vest. And part of it is being driven by Europe because Europe is so important so that even if we got our act together in the United States, that still might be not enough to kick us back up to that potential GDP line. That's why I think we have to really pay attention to East Asia and South Asia as well, in terms of India and Pakistan. Um, those areas really are the future for our growth. But we have to also be really careful and not just jump in with both feet. Um, we have a really big 
program in Asian studies and in connections with Asian businesses at St. Ben's and St. John's. And one of the things that students always come back from there saying is, yeah, we gotta just throw everything into the, there. It's like, wait a minute, no. <laughs> you need to understand the culture, you need to understand the languages and know what's going on. And so to, to answer your question more succinctly, no, I don't think, yes, I think it's holding us down in the short term and no, it's not gonna help us a lot in the short term to, what's going on in Europe is not going to help us very much in the short term, unfortunately. Your graph indicated that the GDP was around 20%, the government share of it, 1920. Why do I hear in the uh, press all the time that the Obama administration is pushing 24%, and this is way above the standard amount, and the Republicans are saying, let's get it down to 19. How does that jive with your figures? Um, the diff make sure again everybody heard the, fig the question about, you know, I have a graph that's got GDP's share, the government's share of GDP around 20%. The difference is that you can measure what government does either by GDP accounting, that is what government's doing in terms of its spending, or you can also include all of its transfer payments. And so when people start talking about uh, government's share getting up at 24, 25%, they're including social security, Medicare and Medicaid in that number. Well, in terms of production, in terms of what GDP measures, those aren't counted. That's money moving from one person's pocket to another. That's double counting. So I would argue that the GDP numbers are a much better way to think about how much in terms of resources is the United States government and all the local and state governments either extracting, if you like to think of it that way, or purchasing from the rest of the economy. But that's the difference, is transfer payments. The only thing I'd say is it's moving from your pocket and my pocket. Yeah. And it's real money. <laughs> oh, it's real. I'm not saying it's not real money, but it's not. The question I would ask is, what do we want as a society in terms of transfer payments? We need to have that discussion, and we've been ignoring it. Um, I make a joke with my dad that his Social Security is about the same as what I pay in. It's close. So why not I just send him a check, right? But then he also points out, yes, but I'd also have to live in your back bedroom. And do you really want that? <laughs> so we're not having that discussion. We need to have that discussion. He's going to be 80 in November, so. Okay. One more. Could you give us a, a simple definition of the fiscal cliff and what it means to the average consumer today? The idea of the fiscal cliff is the game of chicken that the Congress has, has played over the last few years in terms of spending cuts that will go into effect on December 31st. And if those spending cuts were to go into effect, um, we would probably see a decline in GDP of somewhere around 2%. Now, what I find very interesting is that the very same people who say that government spending is not productive are the ones who are saying this is a terrible thing and we can't let it happen because it's going to cost thousands of jobs. Okay, which is it? <laughs> be, con be consistent. I would argue that it really is a cliff. It really is something that we should care about. Um, I don't think we'll go over it, but as a historian, I've learned that just because something isn't likely doesn't mean it isn't going to happen. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. That was very nice. has a tradition of putting a book in the Fair School Library, oh, which is a, a, a great school. And we'd like to have you sign it and maybe give them a little message. I would love to. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next week, John Rash.